United States. First of all, I'd like to welcome our today's panelist, Dr. Vivian S. Walker, Executive Director of the United States Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, and Professor John Torchori, Director of the Wise Diplomacy Center, Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to the faculty, students, and staff of the University of Michigan, in particular those of the Wiser Diplomacy Center and the Ford School, who have so very kindly found time to attend today's event. Finally, I'd like to welcome the many distinguished scholars and practitioners of diplomacy in attendance today from all over the world. I'm delighted that you have joined us and look forward to your comments and insights today. And going forward as we expand the reach and activities of the Global Forum for Scholars and Practitioners of Diplomacy. With this, I'd like to hand over the floor to Professor John Churchury, the Director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center. Thank you so much, Rajal, and, and congratulations on the launch of the Global Forum for Scholars and Practitioners of Diplomacy. You have an impressive list of university partners, and we're glad to, uh, to be among them. Uh, I'm John Chorciari. I'm the director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center. And first, I would like to briefly introduce uh, our expert guest, Dr. Vivian Walker, who is the executive director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. She completed a 26-year career with the State Department, retiring with the senior rank of Minister Counselor. She is now, in addition to her role uh, with the Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, a faculty fellow at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. She's also been an adjunct professor at Central European University, a professor of national security strategy at the US National War College and at the National Defense College in the United Arab Emirates. She's published and lectured widely on the practice of public diplomacy, particularly in complex information environments, very much the theme of today's conversation. Uh, and what we'll do today is uh, we have a lot of great questions uh, from all of you uh, that you've submitted online. Uh, I'm going to lead off with a few uh, queries of my own just to set the table with some uh, some of the major themes of the conversation, and then we'll draw from your questions to continue the conversation with Dr. Walker and to, uh, to gather and gain from her insight. So Dr. Walker, uh, first of all, uh, a virtual uh, warm welcome to the Ford School community. Thank you for being here. I think we've got you on mute. My apologies, no I, I, the first rule. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting uh, me to join this conversation. I very much look forward to it. And a special thanks uh, to Rajal Laskar for his really extraordinary efforts in putting together this global fo forum for scholars and practitioners of diplomacy. And uh, I think it appropriate that this in the first of a series of lectures and presentations the forum would like to do, that we have this discussion about public diplomacy, both from a theoretical perspective, but also from the pra practitioner perspective. So thank you for that. Wonderful. So if I could take a minute to sort of lay out some top lines uh, of some of the issues that I think that um, we, we ought to be discussing, uh, I'll do that. Uh, first, uh, although I realize that we have a number of very distinguished scholars and practitioners of public diplomacy and diplomacy in the audience today, I wanted to take a quick minute to define what we mean by public diplomacy for folks in the audience who may not um, be as familiar with the term. Basically, it's uh, efforts that governments uh, undertake in order to inform and influence foreign audiences to shape their behaviors and perceptions in such a way that serve national interests. And the public aspect of public diplomacy is really important because the focus truly is the people of other countries, uh, uh, the, the people uh, with whom in the long term, we want to build the mutual trust and understanding and respect and credibility that ultimately contribute to uh, our, our national security, everyone's security and prosperity uh, overall. So it's quite a, a lofty goal, but I think important to remember what, what lies behind um, uh, the impetus of our discussion today. So in that line, I want to highlight three areas where I see a lot of challenges coming up. And I know that we will um, we'll be discussing them in, in greater de detail in our conversation. The first of the, these has to do with the impact of COVID. Um, and, as, you, as you might know, um, uh, the uh, COVID restrictions have uh, either uh, uh, substantially restricted or canceled 
a great number of our education uh, and educational exchange programs. And these education and exchange programs are very important to public diplomacy, particularly in developing these long term uh, relationships and developing mutual understanding. Uh, and their closure uh, and um, is uh, risks the abrogation of that critical last three feet. For those of us not in the public pl diplomacy business, the last three feet uh, refers to that space between people. What happens when you have a face to face conversation an actual exchange, uh, and it comes actually from uh, one of the great uh, former directors of the US Information Agency, which was the standalone agency for public diplomacy, Edward R. Murrow. So uh, we risk the abrogation of the last three feet. And one of the things that we need to focus on right away, I think, is getting, the, getting that last three feet back and reopening the doors to exchanges um, uh, and, and walking back proposed limits to, uh, for example, student visa status and uh, and the uh, and the status in general of, of of visas associated with these programs. The second big challenge has to do with the very complex global information environment in which we find ourselves. The impact of big data and artificial intelligence on a state's legitimacy in the global information space. We have so much information available to us, uh, twenty four seven. Um, but the transformation of this global uh, uh, information infrastructure has also intensified the destabilizing impact of malign influence or disinformation operations. Um, it's intensified authoritarian control over information access. Uh, it's raised considerable human rights issues, especially with respect to surveillance and data privacy. And it's really highlighted the need for some international regulatory frameworks. How do we deal with this massive information? How do we work with the social media platforms? Um, another set of questions I think we need to consider. And finally, the third issue set that, um, that I hope we discuss today um, is the need for some kind of um, sustained coordinated effort to assure that within uh, the United States and not just within the government, uh, we have more cohesive action with respect to public diplomacy in the short term, with respect to messaging and advocacy, but also in the longer term with respect to our exchanges and our investments in, in, in relationship building. And not just within the government, but how we uh, capitalize on all of the expertise available to us in the private sector as well. So those are uh, three broad issue areas that I think um, uh, I hope that we have a chance to discuss and I look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. So do I. And, and that lays out a really nice agenda for us. Uh, uh, three major issue areas that we'll touch on in in the course of the next hour. I want to start with the second of the three issue areas you mentioned about digitization and go back to a time that now feels like eons ago uh, pre COVID and talk a little bit about how uh, the digital revolution had changed the nature and approach to public diplomacy even before the pandemic. I think the one thing to um, to remember is that uh, public diplomacy has is in if it's doing its job right, um, its tools are in a continuous state of evolution. It's always changing. Why? Because the information environment is always changing. So to look at the recent set of changes as as anomalous uh, is 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 not helpful. I mean. For example, let's go back to uh, innovations in short and medium wave technology, which enabled um, uh, the, the Voice of America and other uh, broadcasting services. Uh, the technology was out there and was adopted uh, for the purposes of communicating with audiences that were uh, might have otherwise be difficult to reach. And as you know, Voice of America was instrumental uh, in helping to uh, shape the outcome of the Cold War. And there are other examples. The satellite uh, tel uh, technology enabled the creation of the WorldNet system, uh, something that perhaps not everyone is aware of today, but actually the US Information Agency had a very elaborate network of satellite dishes allowing the, uh, the broadcast of programming in countries all over the world. So continuous state of, of evolution. What is different perhaps about the current uh, era we're in is the volume of data and the rapidity of transmission. That does make it unique. 
there's uh, what Joseph Nye identified a few years ago, um, the Joseph Nye of the soft power fame, uh, uh, identified as the paradox of plenty, which is that paradoxically, plenty of information uh, does not lead to greater understanding or greater knowledge, but rather scarcity of attention. You've got so many audiences uh, and so much data out there. How can you be assured that your particular message or message sets are going to reach the audiences that you want to reach, given that there's so much out there that they have to choose from? Um, is it, I think Simon Anholt said a few years ago, Simon Anholt is the nation brand guy. And uh, he talked about the only uh, remaining global superpower being the power of public opinion. Uh, now that might be overstating it a little bit, but when you think about it, every in information consumer in this very complex environment uh, has tremendous power with respect to what sources uh, that, that, that consumer might go to, and then how then the consumer acts on the information that he or she takes in. So, uh, so I think that um, in particular makes the challenge of public diplomacy uh, so difficult uh, uh, these days. Right, and then added to that, of course, we have the pandemic. And I'd like to ask you uh, first a question about the impediments that the pandemic presents above and beyond some of the challenges uh, that you've just alluded to. In particular, what are the what are some of the audiences that you most want to reach uh, that become more difficult to reach uh, in this in this environment with all of the travel restrictions and visa restrictions and the like? Well, uh, that the the number of audiences and the, and the range of audiences uh, that we reach through our exchange programs is, is truly, truly vast. We can start with, of course, uh, students, uh, university, we, we can talk about journalists, we can talk about government officials, we can talk about non-government officials, uh, and people in a whole range of disciplines from, from, from certainly from government and, and um, uh, but and economics, um, uh, politics, history, international relations, science, uh, technology. Uh, there, there is such a range of topics and issues covered by our exchange programs um, that to to suspend them, to have the suspension of these programs, is essentially to create a vacuum, uh, to stop conversations. Uh, to impede the, the, the collaborative efforts that grow out of these exchanges. Um, because these exchanges uh, uh, are meant to continue long after, you know, you, you, the exchangee has returned home, put away his or her suitcase and stuck the passport back in the drawer. The whole point of these exchanges is to uh, start, um, uh, start connections, to generate ideas, to provide uh, people with tool sets that they then apply in, in their own time and in their own context. So there is also this enormous and incalculable, really, multiplier benefit of exchange programs that um, uh, the absence of which uh, it would be, I think, for us, uh, catastrophic. I mean, that obviously some really big challenges there. On the flip side, are there silver linings? Are there, are there ways in which, despite the, the obvious drawbacks of, of the pandemic, that this is actually helping uh, the US government better equip itself for public dip diplomacy going forward? Yes, indeed. Uh, and this, the conversation we're having now is, is one great example of that. It's uh, expanding uh, networks, right? And, and for example, today we have uh, folks, I think, watching and, and, and listening and thinking about these issues uh, around the world. And, uh, and the expansion potential, bringing in new audiences, getting them to participate is huge. Um, and with it, uh, diminished requirements for participation. Uh, you know, to normally to pull together an event where you want the best speakers on a topic and you want the most important audience there requires uh, tremendous effort in terms of logistics and travel and administration. That is, that is, that's erased. Um, and then um, there is also the potential for expansion of stakeholder communities and new and non-traditional stakeholders. We know traditionally who we want to talk to about, for example, public diplomacy. But I just, in my introductory remarks, alluded to the fact that we need to do more and 
better to reach out to the private sector to bring in more participants um, in, 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 um, in, in this exercise. And I think uh, this virtual format uh, enables that. All right. And uh, alongside COVID, of course, uh, we've got other forces that are occurring that present opportunities and challenges. Uh, one of them that uh, is alluded to in some of the questions that the audience has asked and, and that's on my mind is the surge in, in inward forms of nationalism that are occurring in various parts of the world. And I'm interested in your thoughts about how that affects public diplomacy strategies and more specifically, how does one approach audiences that are caught up in inward forms of inward looking forms of nationalism in a public diplomacy outreach that's a great question uh and i don't pretend to have the definitive answer but i do have some i do have some thoughts you're absolutely right there are there are increasingly nationalist and along with that uh somewhat authoritarian tendencies on the rise and I would argue, as I suggested in my opening remarks, that uh, in some, to some degree, this um, accessibility of information and the, and the ability to manipulate information has contributed uh, in, you know, to, this, to these nationalist um, tendencies. Um, so I think, well, so what does that mean in practical terms for public diplomacy? Well, uh, public diplomacy programs uh, uh, do in part uh, focus on providing um, foreign audiences with tools and skills and information and support for democratic institution building. Uh, we've done that, for example, great example would be the, the effort that we put into the countries of the former Soviet Union with the Freedom Support Act funds, you know, after the breakup of the Soviet Union. I remember being a public affairs officer in Kazakhstan uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I had these tremendous resources uh, to work with uh, local audiences to focus on various aspects of democratic institution building, whether that was uh, understanding the electoral process, whether that was working on on reporting and you know and improving journalism, uh, whether that was uh, improving access to education. So, in this increasingly nationalist environment, I think we double down on those democratiz democratization programs, no question, but with some important changes. And uh, the first is, I think, uh, a mistake that I think I made uh, and perhaps my colleagues made um, back in the day in this tendency to project a one size fits all democracy. Democracy is not one size fits all. And the way that a democracy grows and the way that democratic institutions unfold in a particular country are unique to that country, to its people, to their experiences, to their histories, to their legacies. So I think that, uh, yes, you know, promotion of the democratic model, absolutely, but perhaps more nuanced. I think an, a second aspect that public diplomacy is particularly well suited for is uh, promoting transparency and, uh, and information sh sharing. Uh, that is um, the lack of transparency and manipulation of information are probably some of the most dangerous aspects of nationalist movements. So public diplomacy through working with uh, journalists, working with social media platforms, uh, and working with educators can help to promote this 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 uh, this clarity, this transparency, the need to information to share information, um, to promote literacy, media literacy, to un to help people to understand what it is they're reading and hearing, to investigate their sources. And finally, and uh, this is something that again um, uh, a lesson that I learned uh, over the years as a public affairs officer more nuanced promotion of our values. Uh, we truly, uh, there, there are things that we cherish. Uh, every, every country cherishes, America cherishes uh, tolerance, uh, freedom of, of expression, freedom of the press, uh, diversity, uh, and all of those values are important, but I think the way in which we can pro pro we promote them could be more nuanced, um, more in tune with uh, uh, the audiences in in the in those uh, in those countries affected, how they feel about their values, what what matters to them as well. I think we can do a little more thinking in that area. 
Great. Uh, I, and I'd like to pick up on a few of the themes that you just addressed and dive a little deeper into them because we've got some audience members who have asked questions that, that follow on nicely. One of them is that, as you noted, one of the tools used by governments that are fed by this sort of uh, uh, inward looking nationalism is disinformation or misinformation. And so one of our audience members asks, how will public diplomacy change with the move towards dis and misinformation by some actors in recent years, especially in online material? And I'd like to sort of follow up with one of my own to that, which is what types of programs concretely exist to train audiences around the world to be more discerning consumers of information? Great question. I would say that, uh, I don't know that public diplomacy programs necessarily need to change so much as because I think they've been addressing a lot of these issues, but to, to double down, as I was saying earlier, I would uh, divide to answer the first part of the question. I would say that public diplomacy activities fall into two broad uh, categories for countering state disinformation in particular. Uh, the first is deterrence. And this is sort of short term tactical approaches. Uh, and that would be uh, training for journalists, media literacy programs that focus uh, not just uh, on on um, on journalists, uh, but also on educators uh, and uh, fact uh, the uh, helping to support develop and support fact checking platforms. Um, uh, providing um, countries and, and regions and institutions with tools uh, to develop uh, or promote objective sources of information. Those are all practical short term deterrence measures that public diplomacy can play uh, an important role in. And there are great examples um, uh, of media literacy programs, journalism training programs uh, all over the world uh, that uh, that engage in those activities. The second set of, of actions is really more on the strategic level, and that's resilience building. And that's longer term. And that is working with uh, host country uh, governments and partner institutions to uh, identify the social and economic and political vulnerabilities that breed disinformation narratives. Because disinformation is most powerful when it identifies the weakness, the things that aren't working for people, the uh, inequalities that are perceived or actual, the in, in, anything from unequal income distribution to, to uh, issues of discrimination, uh, perceptions of corruption, all of these weaknesses or vulnerabilities are very easily exploited by disinformation narratives because, in fact, there can be a kernel of truth in them or there's enough truth in them uh, to, 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 to sustain uh, the, the narrative. So, so that requires, you know, going back to our conversation about democratic institution building, working with countries to give them the, um, the, the, the to help them develop the tools and the insights they need to address these vulnerabilities and that actually leads well into the next thing i wanted to ask you referenced earlier the importance of being nuanced in our communication of our own values and what aspects of our own system might be worth uh considering or even emulating uh from uh from other parts of the world one of our uh, audience members worries that it looks like America is going through its own social crisis and that there's not enough confidence left in public institutions uh, and wonders how this affects public diplomacy efforts looking outward. That, that, that is a global trend, this sort of decline uh, in, in trust uh, of government institutions and media institutions. Um, there are a number of great st uh, studies out there, um, and um, and uh, Francis, Fuku I commend you to Francis Fuku Fukuyama's writings on the topic. He does he's, he does a very good job of uh, elucidating that. So, um, so to address it, um, the first thing that that we have to be we have to be transparent and honest in the United States about our own crises and our own challenges, I think. And so that's, so transparency begins at home. And, uh, but the, the good news is, is that's a struggle that we are all engaged in. You know, it's not just a US struggle. It's a struggle for the UK. It's a struggle for, uh, for Indonesia. It's a struggle for South Africa. Every country, uh, every government and its media and, and every 
a media set of media institutions has to deal with this challenge. How does public diplomacy deal with it? Again, going back to uh, what I talked about earlier, um, strengthening uh, media institutions, helping them to be uh, to be as effective as possible, helping them to uh, uh, to to be credible. If you can restore credibility in media institutions, if you can get people to be confident in the information that you're, they're receiving, that goes a long way in helping to build trust uh, in other aspects of government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to shift a little bit, to not just talking about the United States, but putting in the context of other, other major powers. Uh, we are at either in the middle or at the tail end of a long period in which the United States has had has had primacy in numerous domains in international affairs, certainly in the military domain, to a lesser extent, perhaps economic, but also ideational power, soft power, technological prowess, the appeal of American higher education institutions, the list goes on. The question is how, uh, when we look at the public diplomacy landscape, how other major actors are, are uh, ascending in this area, uh, and in what ways do they do they challenge uh, U.S. efforts at public diplomacy? Uh, well, great question. I would start by saying that um, the U.S. is uh, always is subject to continuous shifts in public perceptions of its power and influence. Um, uh, this, you know, we're in a period perhaps where uh, global perceptions of, of, of U.S. power and its uh, um, uh, and its and its trust trustworthiness and its credibility are in decline. But we've been in periods like this before, and it is very much tied to public perceptions of our policies uh, and um, and perhaps the, the the behavior of our our leadership. What doesn't change. Uh, necessarily is uh, public respect for uh, basic uh, values of freedom of the press, uh, tolerance, diversity, um, basic uh, public respect for democratic institutions. All of those remain constant over time. Um, that said, uh, there are rising uh, powers, uh, China comes to mind, uh, and there are others who are offering uh, a, a set of, of economic opportunities, education opportunities um, that are, are, are very attractive to, to, to audiences. And, um, and we need to be able to maintain our focus on, uh, in the short term, uh, continuing to be transparent and advocate for our policies and our actions, even if we know people are going to disagree with them. And in the long term, maintain uh, I I the investment in the education and cultural and in exchange programs, the prof professionalization programs um, that, uh, that offer the opportunities that other powers uh, are seeking to provide. Yeah, and, and in that domain and talking about sponsoring international education, we of course have had a growing number of complaints about the possibility that there would be foreign espionage, especially through STEM subjects. We also have all the visa restrictions associated with the pandemic and, and, and even before that with successive waves of national security considerations. Coming out of COVID, it's gonna be even harder to justify budgetary expenditures on non-US nationals. How do you sell the importance of these efforts to a, to a skeptical constituencies, whether it's on Capitol Hill or on Main Street USA? I think the, um, I would say that in general, uh, certainly with respect to Capitol Hill and, and, and Congress in, in particular, um, I found uh, it, it certainly in my tenure as executive director, actually a, a tremendous amount of support for education and, and, and exchange programs and an understanding of the need to, to continue investment. And um, one of the things that we produce every year at the advisory commission is a comprehensive annual report uh, about all of these programs and how much they cost and, and what, they were, what they were meant to do and how we did them. And this comes out of a congressional mandate. Uh, Congress wants to know what's happening. It keeps an eye on these things. and. 
uh, uh, and in certain sectors of Congress works very hard to promote them. So I don't know that we have um, such a skeptical, skeptical audience in Congress. Uh, more broadly speaking, um, they, they, it's true that your, your average person on the street might not appreciate why we should be spending money on, you know, bringing Fulbright scholars to the United States, for example. But I think you can justify uh, exchange programs uh, in the very same terms that you use to justify, uh, you know, the importance of national security and prosperity. Exchange programs, uh, education exchange programs contribute significantly to both. How do they contribute to national security? Well, if exchange and, and education programs are done right and they're doing their job, they are promoting uh, mutual understanding uh, and tolerance, if not wholesale acceptance or embrace of American policies and actions. I think a lot of resistance to, uh, to, uh, to foreign policy uh, practices has to do with mistaken understanding of what the intent is behind it, for example. So now ultimately there is, there is strength um, and security in opening up your society, opening up your values and, and, and encouraging people to, to understand them. The economic prosperity comes uh, from the promotion of, um, of business. The more people you have uh, coming to the US uh, or, or the more people you have engaging uh, with um, uh, in the academic sector, in the commercial sector, the more potential there is for growth uh, in, in, in commerce on the local, regional and national level. So I think you can make the case uh, uh, on both security and economic lines that there is a definite interest or a definite value in not only continuing but increasing these programs. And of course, uh, the relative cost of these programs is, is quite minimal indeed. I certainly agree with uh, both sides of that. And I, I often wonder to myself who we're going to call in a crisis if we don't have anyone who's spent time in the country, knows the language, understands the people and, and the politics here in the United States, has a, a sense of personal association. Certainly those uh, programs that were trimmed right after 9-11 and some of the areas where we most need that type of cooperation were, were in jeopardy. I, I agree with you entirely, but I have a more mechanical follow-up question. Uh, and this is something we think a lot about at a policy school where we have students studying program evaluation and, and trying to, to assess the efficacy of, uh, of particular projects and programs. How do you assess the effectiveness of these measures if you are reporting to the Office of Management and Budget or you're reporting back to GAO or somebody, what types of data do you use to, to, uh, to underpin the assertions about the economic and security benefits of these programs? That is probably the single most important um, question that we can ask about public diplomacy. Um, yes, how do you, it's, it's the monitoring and evaluation of programs. How do you do that effectively? Well, let's start with why it's important. It, it gets to the bottom line. When you're talking about government funding for programs, the, the funding has to be justified. The expenditures has to be justified. You have to show uh, that that there has been um, there's been results for the investment in in time and money and effort. So uh, there's one huge impediment to measuring results in our business. How do you know when you've changed a mind? Right? How do you know when someone's uh, behaviors or perceptions have shifted? Uh, it's something that can happen in two seconds or three seconds, or it's something that can happen in 20 years. And it's something that can take place in a, a, a way that's very difficult to measure, that is maybe clicking on another website, which leads to another website that leads to an aha moment. Or it can be that that person you gave the, um, the, the, the uh, flex exchange, uh, high school exchange scholarship to is now prime minister of her country. The problem with these kinds of investments is that you have no guarantee uh, that these results are going to happen. There's an act of faith, a leap of faith effectively, uh, and uh, which doesn't sound so good in legislative or funding terms. Um, and, uh, and, and then again, and, it's, and then you, and you just don't know uh, how it's gonna work out. So, 
okay, that was a great excuse for why it is that we can't monitor and evaluate. So what? We still need to do it. So then comes the question of identifying um, the best practices and procedures. And I will say that there has been a lot of great work done in the last 10 years, uh, both in the private and the public sector on, on not only um, uh, not only determining performance measures, you know, what to look for, uh, but also um, linking uh, program development to these measures, assigning cost values to these measures and their outcomes. Uh, so there are a number of great ways to do it. Uh, that's the good news. A little more bad news is, okay, but how do you get all of the agencies and institutions that are involved in this process uh, to coordinate their data collection. What happens is that you have, and within the Department of State, you have this split. Within public diplomacy, you have the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs that sort of thinks about its, it measures and evaluates its programs in one way. And then you have the policy shop and you have the Global Public Affairs uh, Bureau thinking about and evaluating programs in another way. Uh, and that's just within the Department of State. Are they wrong? No, they're doing exactly what they, they're supposed to. But when you try to sit down and take it in collectively, you have different and sometimes competing or at least uh, uh, ways of thinking about monitoring and, eval and evaluation that don't match up. Well, that kind of, of um, specialization and nuance is great for the ins individual institution. But when it comes to sitting down in front of Congress and saying, okay, we need X amount of dollars and this is what we've achieved, it's much harder to make the case for impact when you have so many competing ways of measuring that impact. It's a very long answer, but um, uh, but I guess the short version of that is very important, hard to do. We have a long way to go in thinking about how we rationalize the various systems that are out there. Uh, you just brought up, of course, uh, the coordination challenge in, in uh, whether it's m and &E or whether it's uh, uh, information gathering. And uh, that's also one of the three themes, the third of the major three issue themes that you, that you set out in the outset. So let's talk about that uh, because we have a few questions from the audience. And I'll paraphrase one of them. This, this audience member asks, whether we should think of public diplomacy as a term and as a concept in a new light, given the, the, the fact that it's a whole of government function in some regard and, and it's carried out by state, substate, and some civil society actors, maybe I'll layer on top of that the question about what type of coordinating apparatus exists and is it adequate for, for this new framework that our audience uh, a question uh, points to? Uh, your, the audience member is quite right. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing public diplomacy at multiple levels. We've, I've been focusing more or less on uh, public diplomacy at the national or federal level, uh, but there is city diplomacy, uh, there, are, there are institutions, um, there are businesses uh, that all engage in some kind of, 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 of public diplomacy. So, um, and, and there's never going to be, and that's great. It's good to have all of these different resources out there. And uh, there is never going to be one way to coordinate or consolidate all of these different ways of approaching the question of, of public diplomacy, nor would you want one, I think. I think one of the, the, the advantages of the specificity of those kinds of programs is that uh, they are unique and tailored and uh, can produce results um, that are, 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 are very specific to the context and to the needs of participants on both sides. So you want to preserve that diversity uh, specifically and the specificity within those uh, um, programs that, that can be achieved. On the national level, um, if I had the answer to that question, uh, uh, I don't know what, what I, where I would be, but uh, the it's clear that um, we need coordination. It's not clear to me that restoring the US Information Agency, which was the agency that consolidated uh, public diplomacy activities for a number of years, uh, and which was uh, closed down uh, when we had 
in theory, won, uh, won the Cold War and, um, and, uh, and, and we're experiencing the triumph of the return of the, liber the liberal international order. Um, but USIA was an agency that was, first of all, specific to a particular challenge or conflict, the Cold War. Secondly, that was not equipped for what these radical transformations in information technologies. Uh, and third, could not uh, respond to the breadth and, specific, and specificity of challenges. So, but the question is, if it's not USIA, what is it? And I, I don't think there is one entity that can do all of those things. I've seen um, a number of ideas out there, uh, many of them I think worth exploring. Um, there's been some talk, for example, of having the National Security Council uh, do sort of umbrella uh, uh, interagency coordination of, of the, the broad lines of, of messaging, of advocacy, and of identifying priorities for investment in, in, uh, in longer term efforts. Um, I think that the State Department needs to certainly play the, uh, the coordinating role with respect to, um, uh, to diplomatic, to the diplomatic use of public diplomacy. Um, uh, but I'm also interested in ways in which we can incorporate the private sector. Uh, I'm also interested in ways in which we could incorporate some of these regional di di diploma diplomatic initiatives that we, we've talked about. Um, is it possible to have a collaborative council? Uh, is it possible to create a sort of a, a, a large virtual network that uh, is at least keeps everybody who participates in the process aware of what uh, uh, the other is doing. I don't think we can afford to create a whole new superstructure of bureaucracy to organize all of that. But I think there are some, there are some avenues to explore within those options. And so far we've been talking about positive potential for collaboration between public and private actors. But we've got a question here from the audience that points to some of the complications. And the question goes, how damaging is the national media's portrayal of other countries or their citizens for public diplomacy? Imagine a scenario in which the presentation on major media channels of a, of a given society is negative and they see that uh, as what uh, Americans are learning about their society. To what extent is that a challenge and how do you, how do you respond to it? It's a perennial challenge. Um, and uh, we respond to it by providing, uh, you know, other projections of, you know, other ways of, of uh, looking at that country or looking at the set of issues associated with the country. The thing to remember and the thing to stress with our, with our audiences is that's just one way of looking at the problem. That in the United States and in every country, there are, there should be multiple ways of looking at a problem, talking at a, about, a, about a problem, re representing a problem. Um, and in fact, the danger would be to insist that there be a single way of representing these attitudes. That is far more dangerous than anything else. So, um, so to the country that's on the receiving end of this, this negative set of impressions, it's important for them to understand that's just one attitude or outlet outlet emanating from the United States. And public diplomacy can help in you know, providing um, uh, access to these multiple viewpoints. Uh, I think that that's the best way to get around it. Another parallel channel to talking about the news media and, and sort of uh, information that may have a political uh, uh, content to it is to think about cultural diplomacy programming. And we have a, we have a question here from the audience from someone who says, I've been thinking that it's time to reevaluate the variety of cultural programs to see if certain approaches might be more effective and others dated in this media age. Um, and this questioner would appreciate your reflections on, on how cultural diplomacy needs to adapt. That is a, it's a wonderful question. Um, and that goes back to a, a, a recommendation uh, that the advisory commission has made for several years running with respect to the 90 plus programs that are administered by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Um, these programs are, are extraordinary and wonderful and you can read all about them in our, in our annual report, which goes into some detail on all 90 of them. But 
I think it is not, um, it's not inconsistent with our desire to be as responsive and uh, and flexible and cost effective as, as possible to reassess those 90 programs and to decide which of these uh, programs uh, uh, continue to meet our current um, uh, national security and prosperity needs and which programs, uh, perhaps legacy programs, perhaps programs uh, uh, developed in response to a particular set of challenges that might have since um, uh, uh, disappeared, whether there, you know, whether there might be some uh, reconsideration of those programs. Now that's, that's a really tough question. And I understand that because each of those 90 programs has done amazing things. There's no doubt about it. But the reality is, is that we have, we are, we, we are continually looking at questions of funding and we're continually looking at questions of priorities, security and priorities and prosperity priorities. And we have to, uh, I think, think about our cultural programming in that regard as well. Alongside cultural programming, we have sports diplomacy and, and uh, one of our teams at the Ford School, including our, our first of our diplomacy center fellows who graduated last year, are doing some work with uh, the State Department now on a sports diplomacy strategy. Uh, and uh, that team is very interested in hearing your views on some ways in which sports can be most impactful in, uh, in the broader umbrella of, of U.S. public diplomacy, uh, what types of connections can be the most fruitful. I have seen sports diplomacy work in, in uh, multiple contexts uh, and uh, and address multiple issues. It's one of my was one of my favorite tools uh, when I was a, a public uh, diplomacy officer. Um, sports diplomacy uh, helps to promote the obvious, right? The notion of of, of working together, of teamwork. Of, of, uh, of, of coordination, but you can use sports diplomacy to drive home so many important points about and aspects of American society to include tolerance, to include questions of diversity, to include uh, a, a, you know, gender equality. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, programs uh, go on in all parts of the world that open doors and, and open eyes and open up attitudes uh, uh, just by virtue of the presence of the players, of the qualities that they exhibit uh, on, on the floor or in the pool or wherever it is that they're, uh, they're engaging in their diplomacy. I think it's an extremely effective tool. And, it's a tool that doesn't necessarily require language. You know, it's the language of performance. Um, it's the language of grit and hard will, and it's the language of winning and the language of losing with grace. Uh, all of these are, are, are values and ideas and concepts that are tremendously important to communicate, particularly to younger audiences. And I think sports diplomacy is ideal for that. And, and as you as you mentioned, it includes values that include but are not limited to things like women's empowerment, diversity and tolerance. And we have a few questions on that topic. I'll read one of them that I think captures the thrust of the bunch. Uh, many of our most entrenched political leaders are old white and male. What's the value of diversity in diplomats, including in public diplomacy? And how can we ensure that more women, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals and other marginalized groups can enter this important sphere? Um, I can't stress enough uh, the importance of being able to uh, put the people behind our principles. And um, nothing makes uh, our pronouncements on and our, our, our requirements for uh, acceptance of diversity and tolerance worldwide, nothing makes them more powerful than when we demonstrate those principles ourselves. And nothing makes it more difficult to promote those principles when we ourselves uh, are, are seen as, as, as not doing them uh, for, our, for our own country or, or for ourselves. So yes, the more, the more representative we can be uh, in the way in which we promote these ideas and, and, and concepts and principles, the better. The, there has been uh, in the last year or so a really tough conversation going on in the Department of State about questions of diversity. Um, I commend you to a couple of recent issues of the Foreign Service Journal, uh, which is available online, uh, in which you'll find a number of frank reflections 
on uh, on ways in which uh, the state the State Department uh, has fallen short in terms of diversity. Um, there is there there is no other word for it. That's what we've done. What I would also point uh, to is that there have been a couple of very high level uh, reports recently on how to uh, update and change the Foreign Service, including one I think that came out of the Belfer Center in Harvard. I can send you the link for that if I can't remember the exact name, but it has some prominent uh, former very senior um, American diplomats and uh, dealing with diversity is at the top of their list. Uh, and they have a number of, of suggestions uh, with respect to recruitment, both uh, entry level and mid level, um, and also uh, with respect to the, the regular rules and regulations uh, surrounding um, uh, other aspects of, of promotions and assignments. Uh, wait, so there is definitely um, a real move within the Department of State to, to try to address those problems. Of course, in the US, we have this tremendous advantage of having a very diverse population among across many different axes. Uh, and one of our audience members asks, diaspora groups uh, can be strong promoters of public diplomacy. I know because I'm one of them. And my question would be, how do you see the increased role in public diplomacy of diaspora groups, uh, whether it's in Washington, DC, whether it's in, in Brussels or elsewhere? What types of roles can they play? Uh, they can play. They can play all of the roles, frankly, that we've uh, that we've uh, been talking about, and but largely assigned to uh, you know government uh, public diplomacy uh, efforts. Um, in terms of culture, the diaspora groups have an enormous advantage in being able to talk uh, credibly and knowledgeably and in a very engaging way about the cultures, about uh, the history, about the language, about the, the arts of their, their native country in their new countries or new homes. Um, in terms of, um, of helping, of, of, in terms of building that mutual understanding, you were talking about a little, a little bit earlier about uh, the advantage of have, being able to reach out to people who had studied uh, in the United States, uh, states who are living you know, abroad, but who then had that knowledge and could apply it to, um, to issues. And the, the diaspora is a tremendous uh, resource and font of knowledge, should be, for, uh, for governments uh, when looking to, you know, to come up with new ideas about how to approach issues. Diasporas, uh, depending on their, their link with their home countries now, and I realize that not every uh, diaspora group or maybe not every member of a diaspora group necessarily has a strong or positive link of their home country. Um, people have different reasons for emigrating, but for those that do um, have maintained strong ties, whether they're familial ties or academic ties, business ties. Um, that's another way to, to engage in kind of informal diplomacy that benefits both the United States uh, and also uh, home country. So I think there, um, there's a tremendous potential. And um, there's actually quite a few great studies out there of uh, diaspora diplomacy and in particular diaspora public diplomacy. Again, I can uh, send you a few links and you can pass that on if that would be a value. I think it's it's a, a field of scholarship that is extremely important and uh, one that should be pursued. Thank you. Uh, and diasporic communities are one good example of a, a possible force multiplier for public diplomacy efforts. Another, of course, is is the uh, robust civil society sector we have in the in the United States. And and one of the audience uh, participants, uh, I think, aspires to a career in that sector and asks, what insights and advice can you provide to practitioners in the nonprofit sector working in alliance with the State Department on a variety of academic professional and youth programs, particularly when face-to-face -face programs uh, can resume. You know, the, 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 the great thing about the nonprofit sector and about the programs that they run in a, in a variety of fields is that they are truly a, a force multiplier for that people-to-people -people contact, that 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 last three feet that we were uh, that we were talking about at the outset. Um, so I think um, going to work for a, a nonprofit organization 
uh, is a great way to um, to be able to promote some of these 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 values, some of these principles that we talked about. Um, and it's a great way to do good, uh, not only for, for, for our own country, for this country, but for the, the many countries and institutions and populations that are, are uh, touched by the activities of the, of, of, of the, um, of the not-for-profit not sector. Uh, I think they, in, when I have worked with uh, nonprofits in the field uh, as partners in programs, um, I truly felt that they were in some ways the, the best ambassadors of what uh, what uh, of the best of what is uh, in in America the the generosity the willingness to help um, uh, the uh, and the, the commitment to to very basic but very important principles. So I, th I think it's a high calling, and I encourage people to engage in it. I can't resist sharing from my own experience, having worked in the civil society sector, that very often uh, no number of news media stories, no number of written products uh, could replace the role of face-to-face -face contact with U.S. citizens in shaping views of others around the world about this country. And those who think favorably about the United States very often do so in large part because of their interactions with uh, with people who have worked in their area very often through civil society channels. Um, so I, I certainly agree. And if I could just throw in a, a, um, a bit of um, a tip for, for those who are interested in um, the nonprofit sector. One of the skills uh, that I've seen that, uh, that could use more of in the nonprofit sector, I mean, or that, that nonprofits are looking for in people coming in is people who've got uh, the, uh, the marketing, and statistical and uh, economic and business skills, basically, because uh, an important part of the business model of a nonprofit, I know that sounds a little, you know, a little um, uh, inconsistent, right? A business model for a nonprofit, but nonprofits not only have to survive as an organization, but um, the, the better they are at, at not only managing their own finances, but but representing how they are going to make the best possible use of the resources that the government is investing in them to carry out these programs is going to strengthen um, their, their ability to work work eff effectively. Great. A little tip that uh, <laughs> Excellent. I wish I'd had uh, when I uh, when I started. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, at least a few more questions. And our, our theme, of course, is public diplomacy in 2021 and beyond. But I've, I'm going to slip in a few questions here that, that are relevant even in the remains of 2020. Uh, and one of them is a theme a few uh, audience members brought up in their submitted questions about public health and the COVID response. We have a team working right now uh, at the University of Michigan and the Ford School uh, with Diplomacy Lab, which uh, some of the audience members will know is a program that the State Department runs farming out questions from people who are serving foreign service officers or civil service officers uh, to university partners and the university teams then conduct research and and provide their reports uh, that help inform uh, policy discussions and one of our teams is working on on uh, information and disinformation in Africa, specifically with an eye toward public health. I know we've talked about this in general terms uh, with regard to disinformation earlier in the session, but I wonder if you could share some thoughts on what a uh, an effective public health public public health focused public diplomacy effort looks like in this context, with specific reference to COVID. You know, I, it, to be honest, uh, I feel like I would need to, to go beyond the very general, which is to say, uh, getting out, uh, getting out ahead of the story, uh, anticipating and addressing the the disinformation that comes out about these stories, promoting uh, tra transparency, uh, being as flexible and as accommodating about providing information. Uh, all of them hallmarks of effective public diplomacy, I would say apply to uh, doing particularly public health uh, outreach in these times, but I can't really speak uh, more specifically than that without you know, the, the knowledge or the background. Um, but I would say some of the top line issues that we've identified uh, apply as well. Um, we talked about credibility, certainly credibility is, is one key aspect of it, because when you're talking about 
public health, you're talking about people's well-being, and sometimes you have to get them to to do things or change behaviors or you know it, it, take actions that require um, a tremendous amount of trust and credibility in order to get people to to, to take those actions. So I think that would be a, a really critical aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, and I'll ask one more, and that is on everyone's mind, we're in the midst of a transition with you know some some uncertainties that have existed around that. Um, but <clears throat> be interested in your thoughts on what are the special challenges and opportunities for practitioners of public diplomacy uh, during a period of presidential transition in the United States? Good question. The first thing I would say is that um, there are, I think, the same set of challenges uh, that any new administration faces. Uh, I'll talk about some uh, now that could be applied to, to the previous administration when, when they came in, and it will probably apply to administrations down the road. So um, there are unique, there are a set of challenges, I think, unique to this period. Um, but not to the politics. Uh, and um, the first thing that I think we need to remind ourselves, although perhaps uh, maybe maybe not so much anymore, is that there's tremendous public global public expectation about the new, a new administration. And that's good and bad. There are, are um, there are people who uh, countries and institutions out there who were not happy with the previous administration and are looking, have great expectations of change uh, in a direction that suits their interests. There are going to be people in countries and institutions who uh, were happy with the previous administration and are going to now uh, view the incoming in, uh, um, administration with a little trepidation, you know, what's going to happen. So uh, different kinds of expectations and rule number one, you're never going to make everybody happy, right? Because everybody is coming in with a different set of expectations. So, uh, so you've got to, I think that the priority of public diplomacy in this period is understanding what these expectations are and they are varied and then responding them to them. And you can do this, uh, I think in three ways. Uh, transparency is first, get out there quickly with the basic elements of the policy agenda and make it accessible uh, and make it understandable. Absolutely important. Um, secondly, credibility. It, you've got to assure a steady stream of consistent, credible information. Um, and because credibility is really your calling card in the global competition uh, for, uh, for, for influence, right? If you are credible, if, if you are believable, if you put things out that are fact-based, consistent, and, and, and that can be, uh, can be proven, then you will more likely to build trust in your audiences. Now, trust in your word is not the same thing as necessarily accepting your policies, but trust goes a long way toward eventual acceptance or at least tolerance of policy. So you need to start there. And finally, um, the consistency and coordination uh, of this messaging of this advocacy. Going back to our conversation about disinformation, um, nothing uh, is more valuable to a disinformation operator or malign influence actor than apparent discord or inconsistencies. That's the easiest thing to exploit. So, in, so lack of coordination, lack of unity and cohesiveness of messaging end, ends up being, a, I think, a national security weakness. At the same time, if there's lack of a consistency or coordination, that worries your partners and your allies, the good actors as well. So in order to strengthen your security and, and prevent the exploitation of narratives that are coming from the blind actors, and in order to reinforce your partners and allies' confidence in you, you have to be able to assure that coordination. So I'd say those are the three areas that I would, uh, I would encourage any new administration to focus on. 
Thank you. Very, very sensible. And and as we wrap up, I'll, I'll end with something that I that I like to ask uh, uh, to all of our uh, experienced practitioners, and that is just a quick set of of closing thoughts on what competencies uh, our students, uh, audience members, uh, should be focused on as they prepare to embark on careers in this and related spaces. It's interesting to look at the intake for the Foreign Service. Um, you might think that uh, the majority of folks who get into the Foreign Service uh, come at it with backgrounds in international relations or political theory. Not so. Uh, the Foreign Service is strong, the US Foreign Service is particularly strong because of the diversity of backgrounds, interests, skill sets uh, that people bring to the service. Uh, so, um, so I would say that there is not one particular topic that you, you, can, you can study uh, or a particular set of languages or no, it's rather uh, habits of mind that I think that are important to cultivate. And you can do that, uh, you know, studying just about anything. Um, critical thinking, ability to write and speak effectively, open mind, an essential curiosity about the world, uh, but also a, 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 a fair streak of pragmatism is essential as well. Now, yes, it, it, the Foreign Service exam, uh, if you're going the, the, the government route, uh, will require some general knowledge of history, of political theory, of geography, of, uh, of economics, but nothing that uh, uh, someone who is interested in the world, who, who keeps up with developments, um, uh, who, who thinks hard and rigorously about things, nothing that uh, that, that individual can handle. So I would say it's more as, with, as Flannery O'Connor would have called it, uh, a habit of mind. Um, and I have to confess, uh, my, my academic preparation for this was a PhD in literature. Um, so, uh, and, and again, the, the qualities that, that, that certainly helped me in the Foreign Service are all ones that I've just described now. Well, you have you have proven it with a Flannery O'Connor reference, which is uh, unique among our our contributors in this this semester's uh, series of diplomacy seminars. And so, uh, uh, Dr. Vivian Walker, thank you so much for these wonderful insights on public diplomacy uh, and related issues. Thank you, of course, to Rajal Laskar and to the Global Forum for Scholars and Practitioners of Diplomacy. Uh, we hope that this has been. Uh, uh, as enjoyable and, and, and informative an event for all of you as it has been for me. We're grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with the Global Forum and, and certainly look forward to doing so again uh, in the future. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much.